Welcome to the gathering place right here in beautiful, drenched Simi Valley, California. <laughs> Had lots of water, which is a good thing. It is, it is Thursday night, the 12th of um, <clears throat> January, 2023. We're still here. In uh, 1980, 1979, 1980, Everybody was talking about the rainbow money, how that the one world government was about to take over. Can you believe the Christians were prophesying about the power of the one world government? It's amazing that, it's amazing by the grace of God that the church withstood all of the malarkey, it's a Joe Biden word, all the, all the malarkey that took place really from the 70s on through 2000 where the church was basically prophesying the power of the Antichrist, the power of the one world government. Can you believe we were doing that? <laughs> the Antichrist is coming. Oh, okay, let's, let's, let's the church prophesy the power of the Antichrist. One world government's coming. No, we're not here to prophesy about the Antichrist. We're here to prophesy about the Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, the rainbow money never came. And um, 1988, 88 reasons why Jesus returned in 1988 never happened. You know, all through the 90s, all the different things, Israel coming down on, Russia coming down on Israel, and <clears throat> never happened. <clears throat> Year 2000, everything was supposed to collapse, never happened. 2001, you know who was on, you know who was on broadcasting that we're going to have another major attack? There's a bunch of preachers. Oh my God. Like they're prophesying the works of the enemy. Thankfully, we had a good friend named Kim Clement, and he was prophesying something completely different. He said there'll, ne there'll not be another major attack like that in our lifetime. And there hasn't been. That's a true prophet. But Bob, sometimes prophet prophesied, does that? Yeah, that's true. He prophesied the planes coming into the buildings. So he, he did see that. He did prophesy that. He prophesied the floods in New Orleans. But they're, you know, they're ready. They're like, like, here we go, you know. And it didn't happen. And then it was, what, 2012, the Mayan calendar? Yeah. So I don't even know what years they're going to throw out now. But we have to quit prophesying the power of the Antichrist. We have to start prophesying the blessing of the Lord. You know, every time I saw that sound, that sign, severe drought, severe drought, severe drought. But the Holy Spirit came on us one night and we began to say the rain is coming. And it hasn't stopped coming since that time. And um, I'll tell you more. I got a text from somebody about the drought. But anyway, I'll tell you that more about that in a minute. Anyways, we're supposed to be prophesying the will of God. Now, just because the will of God is prophesied doesn't mean it always happens. Saul was supposed to be a king forever. Samuel prophesied it, but it didn't happen. Samuel wept and cried and prayed. Why? Because it said none of his words had ever fallen to the ground, except these words fell to the ground. Because God changed his mind. And he said, because of Saul's disobedience, that he was going to raise up somebody else. It was David. Moses prophesied the children of Israel would go into the land of promise. But they didn't. They died in the wilderness. But they did, Bob, eventually. Yeah, the next generation. Those 20 years and younger. But the generation that didn't believe, they died in the desert. That word never came to pass for them. Why didn't it come to pass? They didn't believe it. God's word is God's will. I mean, there's some things he's just going to do. But his word is his will. There was no man, even if they had no sin, there was no man that could have ever done what Jesus did. There was no man that could have done it. Only God himself could do what was necessary to give us eternal life. And even that God-man, that man without sin... 
in the garden had to go and pray three times for the strength to do what he did. The stress upon him was so severe that his sweat became blood. And so the very first blood released from the body of Jesus was in a garden. The very place where man ate of the tree and fell from grace was in a garden. That he would live by the sweat of his face, by thorns and thistles. And they did, they put thorns on his head as he took that curse. Jesus knew what the will of God was, but he had to pray that he could fulfill it. He prayed three times. He didn't say, God, I don't know what your will is. What do you want me to do? He said, Father, please take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not what I will, but what you want. Why did he pray three times? Remember what he said? Remember what he said to Peter when he, when he tried to kill Malchus, the servant of the high priest? Cut off his ear? He said, hey, I could call, I could, I could pray to my father right now and he'll send 12 legions of angels. Now, the reason he felt so bold, because there were 700 Roman soldiers there, the reason he felt so bold is because they said, you know, who are you looking for? Jesus says, here I am. And they all went to the ground. They were all knocked over. Peter was going to just wipe them all out. <laughs> Samson, he's going to take them all out. That's the beginning of the revolution. We're going to wipe the Romans out. Man, Jesus just put them all down in one word. We're just, I'm just going to finish them off and then let them send the Roman legions. We'll take them all down. But Jesus stops him, heals Malchus, said, my kingdom's not of this world. This is not, he goes, this is not the kingdom I'm building. I'm building a different kingdom. So Jesus, through all the torture and the torment and everything he suffered, at any time he could have cried out and the angels would have come and delivered him and we would have never been saved. God's word to the woman in the garden would have never been fulfilled, but it had to be fulfilled. No man could have ever done that. No man could have ever, could have ever held his peace. But Jesus did. Through all the beatings, through everything he took. He had enough authority himself to just stop everything with his word. Jesus walked in the absolute authority of Adam that Adam had in the beginning. The same authority that you and I have that we have no idea how to use. Or you know, a little bit. We have little idea. But not really. But we're learning. That's how you overcome death. That's how you overcome sickness and disease. That's how we overcome a lot of things that we, we've just been going, God, what do you want me? What do you want me to do next? He, he, what he wants us to do is to learn to become sons in the fullness of who we are. Which is why Paul prayed such interesting prayers. Now, the early church, the early apostles, they knew about authority because they walked with Jesus. And John, he understood it enough to where nobody could kill him. They tried to boil him and all. They tried to kill him. They couldn't kill him. So they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos. That's how much he understood the dominion that he had. So when you look at this prayer that Paul has, which we're going to do, and we, we, um, we've started on it a couple weeks ago. <laughs> so let me read through at least the part that we've, we've got past so far. He said, when I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and love unto all saints, because remember, faith works by love. None of this works without love. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So this is his prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. In other words, that you would know God. The eyes of your understanding, in other words, what you can see. What you can see in the inward man. Being enlightened that you may know the, what is the hope of his calling or the hope to which he has called you which is to be conformed to the image of his son, Romans 8, 29. That is, that you are called to be the image of his son. 
and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. His inheritance is, is in you. We're looking, we're looking for God, and this is how a lot of prayers go. We're praying, God, do something for me. God says, I've already done something to you. That's why you don't see Jesus walking around praying about all kinds of stuff. Nothing he did, he prayed about. Except he blessed the food, but he just blessed it. But what did he do that he, that he prayed? Did he pray to raise the dead? No, he just raised them. Did he pray to heal the sick? No, he just healed them. Did he pray to cast out devils? No, he just cast them out. Did he pray to walk on the water? No, he just walked on the water. Did he pray to turn the water to wine? No. He didn't, he didn't pray about any of that stuff. Now when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he goes, Father, I know you, are, you, you always hear me. So he was praying every morning. We know that early. He was before the Lord. But everything he did, he did as the second Adam. He did as a man. In Matthew 16, he said to them, he said, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He called himself the Son of Man. Jesus did what he did with the authority of a man. Not as the Son of God, but as the Son of Man. He died for your sins as the Son of God. Because no man could do that. But everything he did, and that's, Mark, that's what Mark eleven twenty three 23 is. The tree you curse is dead. I say unto you, have the faith of God. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain. He's telling them, you can do everything I can do. He goes, not only that, you're going to do more than I do. Because I go to the Father. He that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also and greater than these. But why can't we do them? Because we think God's supposed to do them. So, Lord, do this. And so we're praying all of these prayers to have God do what God's telling us to do. Now, it does help when the Lord shows you things because then you just speak them. That's, a, that's the authority. That's the dominion. But this is what he's praying here. He's praying that we comprehend what he's given us in him. That night, did we ask God for the rain to come? Or did we just declare it? We declared what we heard. The rain is coming. The rain is coming. We just declared what we heard. Yeah. That's dominion. That's what Jesus had. That's what his men had. And 2,000 years later, we almost know nothing about it. Thank God for people like Kenneth Hagin and others like him that prayed, he prayed these prayers thousands of times and he finally started understanding the authority. I'll just tell you, for some reason this story, it's a simple story and it's not a big deal, but it kind of stands out to me a little bit. He went to, him and his wife went to visit some friends and they said, oh, no, 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 don't come in, we have, we have the really bad case flu. They go, oh no, it won't, it won't, it won't, uh, it won't affect us. I don't know, we have a really bad case of the flu. That won't affect us. Now, you could, you could go out there and have it in your head and say that and get the flu. Say, I'm believing God, I won't, I won't get the flu, but you get the flu. But he had a revelation of his authority. There's a difference between knowing that you have authority and then having the revelation of the authority. It's a big difference. And that's where a lot of people have gotten hurt and even killed because they knew about authority, but they didn't actually have the revelation of the authority. But they, you know, they went and they greeted them. They sat there and they go, um, he goes, um, yeah, it, it, it goes, we won't get anything. It won't, it won't come on us. It wasn't speaking in pride or arrogancy or anything like that. He was not an arrogant man. He was speaking by dominion, faith. I don't even know how to say this humbly, but I say as humbly as I can. And I know it's by the grace of God even more than my understanding of dominion. 
But it, when everything hit the fan in 2020, I'll be honest, I haven't had anything at the stake. You know, I mean, I, have, I mean, I was hugging all kinds of people that had COVID and everything else. I never got anything. I didn't even, now, it wasn't like I was like, oh, I'll hug you because I won't, you know, I didn't even know they had it until days after. People in my family had it that I was living with. Nothing. What, what about them? Well, they didn't understand the dominion, I guess, as good as I did. You can have faith for others for a season, but at some point their faith has to kick in. Well, you haven't anything? Nothing. And I say by the grace of God, because I understand dominion, but there's things I don't fully understand. Well, there's times your, your flesh can get the best of you a little bit. I told you the story the other night when I got the call at 1.30 in the morning, just like last week. I thought, I thought, Michael, I thought my alarm had gone off. <laughs> I, thought, I thought my phone was waking me up. It's not even supposed to ring. I was completely groggy. I said, oh, I got, I got a peanut allergy in my body. It's completely reacting. Can you pray? But I didn't really pray. I just spoke. I spoke to her blood. I spoke to the allergy. I commanded it to leave. But then I did ask God to send angels, healing angels. Before I was off the phone, their body stopped swelling. The, the reaction stopped. And she said, I feel so much better. I said, okay, rise up again, call me back, because I'm already awake. And I know me, I'm not going to really sleep the rest of the night. <laughs> so thanks for nothing! <laughs> but you know what? I was not well rested the next day, but I got a good story out of it. Now that day has gone and passed, so who cares? So she texted me, she texted me the next day, she said, the, the people I was with were blown away that, that suddenly everything just stopped and it all stopped. That's dominion, that's authority. When Kenneth Hagin said, no, the flu can't get on me, he wasn't being arrogant or anything like that. He was exercising, he understood what it meant to exercise dominion and authority as the sons of God. What's the exceeding greatness? Well, I, I want to go back just a little bit. You know, the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance. The riches of the glory of everything that God has is in you. You are the inheritance. You are the pearl of great price. He has put everything in you. So we're asking God for all this stuff. Now, there's stuff we're supposed to ask God for. Don't get me wrong. But we're asking God for all this stuff. But what we need to ask him for is, God, show me who I really, show me what you have actually put in me. But first, and that's the first part of the prayer, show me who you really are. Because if he shows you who you really are, you'll be like, you walk around like going, I'll feel loved. I'll feel so loved. Most people don't feel loved or appreciated. They don't. A lot of times parents don't know how to say I love you or I appreciate you or I'm proud of you or anything like that. They don't know how to say it. God loves you. He appreciates you. He adores you. Uh, so the first part of the prayer is to know who He is. And when you know who He is, then you can begin to understand, you can begin to understand why He invested so much in you. Why you are so important. Why He's given so much to you. Oh, let's, bother. let's go use our dominion and uh, wipe some people out. No, 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 no. Jesus didn't use his dominion to wipe people out. The guy who was coming to kill him, the guy who was sent, the leader of the group, Malchus was a servant of the high priest. He was the leader of the group that came to get Jesus to crucify him. He didn't use his dominion to wipe that guy out. Because faith works by love. God is love, and the dominion that he's given you is, what is it, uh, not a converter, but it's, it's regulated by love. Because they were coming back, and you know, suddenly the crowds weren't coming out to see Jesus. He'd done all these healings and all these things for them. They weren't coming out to see him. 
They go, we need to call fire down from heaven on these people. And he goes, you don't even know what spirit you're of. So this is where, this is where a lot of believers, they, they start thinking, well, I have dominion. And they're going to take dominion over their brothers and sisters or over other people. That's not what he gave us dominion for. It's dominion to help him rule his kingdom. 80 or 880 trillion years from now, it's going to say, Dana, see that planet 50 trillion billion light years away? Yeah, could you blink over there and settle this thing for me? Right away, Father. Boom. Sons of God. Going about their father's business. In love. All works, all works in love. Doesn't work without love. You can get by with it. You can get by for a little while, but at some point it catches up. He said, I'm praying that you know the exceeding greatness of his power to us who are who believe. According to the working of his mighty power. I didn't, actually didn't mean to teach on any of this. I meant to go straight to the 21st verse. The greatness of his power, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. He goes, so, he goes I want you to understand the greatness of God's power, that it, the, the power that it took to raise Christ from the dead after three days. When he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. And then he begins to declare what that power, where it put him, far above all principality and power. So we technically have dominion over every principality and power. In other words, even the ones that are not on the earth. It's like like uh, one of the things Jesus, when he, one of his visitations with Kenneth Hagin, he showed him some things about spiritual warfare, and he said. Now, the principalities and the powers, he goes, you will never have to deal with them directly. He goes, the angels of God deal with them. Now, that's what happened with Daniel. The, the angels, Michael and Gabriel. You know, Gabriel came with a message, but then Michael had to come. Now, Gabriel didn't come by himself. He came with his army, and Michael came with his army, and they fought with the army of the prince of Persia, having the dominion. Now, they could have just, listened. they could have just wiped him out at any time. But because of the dominion of men on earth, they couldn't just push them out of the way. Because men had been giving the, their dominion to the darkness. Uh, so these armies had a right to stand a certain amount of ground because the darkness gave them the dominion. But when Daniel went in there and him and all of his people, and they fasted and they prayed, they gave their dominion to the army of God. And the army of God was able to overwhelm the unholy army, and then the revelation was able to be released in the earth. That's why it's so important what we say and what we believe. That's why we have to stop watching, really, I'm going to say 90% of the news we watch, we've got to cut it out because it's telling us how bad everything is. You know, I've been blessing California, and we've been, you know, every time we pray over the offering, what do we do? We declare the blessing of God out of, out of Malachi 3, and we declare the rebuking of the devourer for his sake. But, you know, well, people, they're all running out of California. It's a hell pit and everything else. Do you know that we just became the number four economy in the world? We just passed Germany. Ha, ha. Sprachen die. No, I mean, we passed them. California. Everybody's burying us, but we're not buried. Why? Because there are people in this state proclaiming the goodness of God over our state. But there's so much darkness. Well, there was so much darkness when the children of Israel went into the land of promise. Their job was to tear down the giants. Their job was to destroy them and to retake the land. That's our job. But you have to have dominion to do it and not out of hate or not out of spite, not out of we're going to get even. It's got to be, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say, Lord? You know, we know that we know the prophetic word gave us and has been giving us rain. But you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, that the unjust are just as blessed by the rain as you are the just. 
that people are blessed because of righteous. The righteous people, the dominion they use blesses the just and the unjust. Those that don't deserve it. God loves them too. Far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which should come. So you, mentally, right now, you could read this scripture and say, I have power over all the powers of darkness. Mentally, you know it, but you may not know it spiritually. Because that takes some insight, that takes some revelation, has to be revealed to you. So we know it mentally, but we have to Learn it spiritually, and that's where praying in the Holy Spirit especially, it allows the Holy Spirit to teach you who you are. But I believe we're living in a season when God is releasing revelation of the dominion that we have as the sons and daughters of God to release His will on the earth, and that no demon can stop it. All of all, all words of strife, envy, hatred, division. Those are all the weapons of the enemy to bring down the world or to bring the Antichrist spirit into ascension before his season. I shouldn't say his, the man of sin season, which is not right now. It's not for some time. says he's put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church. That, that's you. He's the head, we're the body. As Kenneth Hagin was saying, when the Lord showed him this, he said, the highest demon, he goes, you might ever have to wrestle is the rulers of the darkness of this world. So when you pray and God tells you his will and you begin to speak his will, His angels in heavenly places are released against principalities and powers. But you might have, you know, you might have to deal with the madman of Gadara one day. (laughs) How do I deal with it, Bob? If you're afraid, run. But if you're not afraid, the authority will be there. And you will not run. It says, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So we're his, we're his body. The Passion Translation, which I don't want to read the whole of it. I just want to go down to the 23rd verse. And now we, his church, are his body on the earth, and that which fills him who is being filled by it. So what does Jesus on the earth look like? He looks like you. Did Jesus whine when he was on the earth? Nope. Did he complain? No. What did he do? He did the will of the Father. The miracles that he did were necessary. It was necessary for him to multiply the food because there were multitudes out there and he said, they've gone three days without eating. If they go back without eating, he goes, they're going to faint in the way. So it was necessary for him to feed them. The wedding, was it necessary for him to give wine to a bunch of people who were drunk? Not really. But his mother didn't want them to be embarrassed, so she said, do as he says. Uh, I don't know, maybe he was doing some stuff at home. How else would she know that? So he goes, go fill these things up with water. Governor comes out and says, man... Usually you save the good stuff. You, you give the good stuff in the beginning when, you know, when men are drinking. And they're like, ooh, that's really good. But after they've been, after they're well drunk, in other words, they can't tell anymore, then you give them the cheap stuff. He goes, but you've saved the good stuff till the end. No, Bob, it was <laughs> grapefruit juice. They don't think so. It wasn't like Jesus was trying to get these guys plastered. They were already plastered. But Jesus is not against, listen, he's not for drunkenness or getting drunk, but Jesus is about celebrating and joy. He helped them celebrate at that wedding. 
I tell you, Bob, they'll never be wine at my wedding. That's fine. <laughs> wine to kill, two different things there. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I've been, I, I, at my daughter's wedding, I think the Christians were as plastered as the, the non-Christian. But you know what? Oh, I don't think I know. <laughs> and I said, well, it is a wedding. Just don't drive home on your own. But you know, there were some people there, there were some relatives that, you know, that... Um, they really, our whole relationship became so much better because they're always kind of tight and they got drunk and they really loosened up. <laughs> I'm always loose. You know, so. What does that mean, Bob? Six pack every day? No. Thankfully, God made me hate beer. And I say hate, I mean detest. All right, let's move on. So in Colossians, which is the third prayers in Colossians 1, we're not going to that. I want to read this out of Colossians 2. And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, that's past tense, has he quickened or made alive, together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailed it to the cross. In other words, all the laws that were against you, um, he blotted out the laws. So if there's a line here and the law says, if you cross that line, you're breaking the law and you get a penalty. If, if you remove the line, there's no penalty because there's no law that says you can't cross the line. In other words, in your relationship with God, he's blotted out everything that can condemn you. But Bob, we could, we could, we could still sin. Yeah, because it's 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 in your soul and it's in your body. That's why your body ages. That's why your soul can become tired. But if you can, in relationship with God, allow the presence of God to come into your soul and your body, He'll revive your soul and revive your body. We have exam- I mean, the example is obviously father of faith, Abraham and Sarah. Bodies and soul revived. 90-year-old woman wins beauty contest. Two kings fight over her to be her husband. However, find out her half-brother is actually her husband. I mean, seriously, these kings, they weren't, they weren't, they weren't looking for 70, 80 year old women going, oh, you know, you know, um, you want to go on a date? They weren't. Think about King David when he was old and they, nothing could motivate him. What did they do? They brought the most beautiful young virgin and made him his, made her his wife. Even she couldn't wake him up. That's the way things were then. Well, Bob, that's a sexist. That the world was sexist. You just don't understand that's the way it was. <laughs> no, Mike, you're going to get me started. I mean, I still think we live in a world where men should be men. I mean, they just have to be. Always. I mean, I say that having four daughters, you know, they always... You have four daughters. You're corrected a lot. I'll just tell you that right now. Don't do that, Dad! <laughs> I just say, you should know me better than that. I'm going to do it. Because I'm a man! Anyways, I'm a very nice man, but I'm still a man. Jesus was a man. He spoke with a lot of authority but he spoke with a lot of kindness. And if he needed to, he grabbed people by the scruff of the neck and threw them out of the temple. So he blotted out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, nailed it to the cross. So we should have no more sin consciousness. There should be nothing 
that prevents us from going into the presence of God and receiving that restoration. And then it says here, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. When did he do that? When he went down into Abraham's bosom and said he, he, he took captivity captive, he rescued all of them, he defeated Satan and all of the demonic authorities there in that place. It said he took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Jesus has the keys to all of them. He has the keys to death, he has the keys to hell, he has the keys to the grave. A demon just can't come and take somebody that you love and say, I'm taking them to hell. Can't do that. Because if your prayer's over them, protect them. Because Jesus has the keys. And you are, by the way, you are Jesus. Oh, you're not the specific man that died on the cross, but you're his body on the earth. We just read that. You possess that dominion. You have the keys. Where are they when I lock the door? <laughs> Me too. So we're learning. We're praying to learn. We're praying to walk close to God so that we can learn of the dominion he had. You know, we, look at these, we look at the prophets of old and we look at the, the disciples and those that walk with Jesus and go, why, can, why can't we do that? Well, that's a good question. But there has to come a time we have to quit asking why and say, and come into the presence of God and start doing. I think there was a, a, during Moses' day, there was somebody out prophesying. They go, Moses, this guy's over here prophesying. He goes, I wish everybody was doing that. They thought, no, you know, you're the only, the holy one, Moses, you're the holy one, you know. No, he goes, I wish everybody was out there prophesying. <laughs> the job of people like me, the job of the ministry, is to put you in a position where you're exercising the dominion of the kingdom on the earth. Oh, Bob, I want to I wanna start a man, I want to build a ministry. I don't. I want to obey the Lord. I want to train you up to take dominion wherever you're at. At your job, take dominion. Whatever that may be. Maybe you're going to take over the business. I don't know. Maybe you're not a businessman. You don't want to. I remember I went to this, there was, when I went to Oklahoma, I was 21, I went to Bible school, and I was looking for jobs, and there was a lot of really low-paying jobs because there's a lot of, you had a lot of Bible school students from Royal Roberts University and from Rama, so there's a lot of competition, uh, and they, it, was a lot of, it was a lot of cheap labor, let's put it that way. They weren't paying a lot. But I did, I found a job at this one really swanky restaurant up on the hill and it paid about a dollar or so more an hour than everything else. I was like, I was pretty happy about that. But when I was there, I noticed sometimes, and there was other, obviously other Bible school students there, uh, sometimes the whining about the place and everything. I always, when I came in there, I blessed the place and I prayed over the place. So they, they promoted me to the head cook there. And uh, you can cook, Bob, when I'm hungry. Yes, I can cook when I'm hungry. Other than that, not so much. <clears throat> but um, when I would go in there, I would go in early before the other, pe other guys got there, and I would begin to prep things. And I would sit there, and I'd pray in the Holy Ghost, and I would bless that place. And I would call blessing, and if, I ever, if it ever got slow, I would call customers to come in. So I prayed over, and I blessed the place, and it prospered while I was there. And I, so I went in, and I said, I'd like a raise. And they just gave it to me. They go, don't tell anybody else. I said, that's fine. <laughs> So they, they gave me raises whenever I asked them for it. And then um, when I left that place, less than six months, they went out of business. But they were extremely pro... Oh, no! You missed the point of the story, Randy. They went out of business, but when I was there, they were prospering. Why? Because wherever you go, you have the dominion, the authority to prosper a place. A lot of Christians, they just, they just they talk things to death. They, they, they buy into the spirit of Antichrist and they just speak it and they, or they buy into the news and they just complain. This is wrong and this is wrong and this is, and this is all wrong. God wants us to bless the United States. We have dominion over the powers of darkness. 
And I'm not, listen, I'm not telling you to go out and say, say, I come against the prince over the state of California. <clears throat> and I challenge you to a duel. You know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you do stuff like that. Just thought of a funny story of somebody I knew that took down all these princes. <laughs> he, was a, he just barely got out of the Bible school. And I, oh, I've fallen one the day. And I was like, uh, yeah, you didn't take anything down. You don't go into a fight unless God puts you in the fight. You understand me? I mean, I was a very young pastor, and I felt impressed of the Lord to fast and pray for three days, and I was fasting and praying. And I said, hey, um, it's a girl who's demonized. She's got like a bad demon. Torments her the night. She can't sleep. She was the girlfriend of the head of the Buddhist monastery. And the Buddhist demons are nasty demons. You know, oh no, they're peaceful. But no, 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 they're nasty. And they said, would you, would you pray for her? Uh, they're Christians. They're asking me to pray for her. That means that they couldn't pray for her. They didn't believe that they had the authority. But they did. They didn't, they didn't believe it. I said, okay. So I met at, at their house. And I started praying. And I started casting this thing out. And I would cast it out. But then we'd come back. And I was, and I'll cast it. It's like the battle went on for, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. Finally, I just called it out by name. They called the foul Buddhist demon out by name and commanded it, all of its minions to leave. And, you know, she talked smack back to me a couple times and just, shut up! You know, but if somebody had come in there and think, oh, God, why is he yelling at that woman? That poor woman, he's just chewing her out. I wasn't. I was just telling her to shut up. I was telling the demons to shut up. Because I wasn't interested in what they had to say. So cast all these spirits out. I don't know how many. It seemed like there were hundreds. But there was one really nasty spirit. She was living in the Buddhist monastery where the big nasty spirits were. So she had a big, nasty Buddhist demon. <laughs> and um, she got completely delivered. She slept that night. It was the first time in five years she slept through the night. And I made sure I followed up on her and prayed over her. Because you can't just cast a spirit out of somebody and then just go, well, oh, see, I hope everything works out for you. Because they'll be more demonized. But she, like a lot of people that are demonized, she could see the demons so she told me afterwards, she said, yeah, when you command the demons to go, they would go. And then this one big one would call them back. And then you command them to go and they start going. And this big one would call them back. So they kept going back and forth. She said, until you call the big one by name. And then when he left, they all left. That's because we have dominion. Well, why did you, why did you have to fast and pray? Because your soul... Now your soul knows that you shouldn't go eat that chocolate pie or whatever, right? But you go and eat it anyways. Why? Because it, it tastes good, Bob. We'll just resist it. No! You know, <laughs> so fasting and praying, all fasting does is fasting literally slaps your soul down to where your, your consciousness and your body go, oh, You've been lying to me. I don't have to believe you. So then when you come in contact with a demon and the demon starts lying to you, you don't have to believe it. Your soul won't believe it because it has been put in a position. But you, as far as dominion, you have dominion. Jesus' men, they had dominion over sickness, disease, and death, yet they couldn't cast a demon out of that boy. It wasn't because they didn't have authority. They had the authority. But Jesus said this kind goes out by nothing by prayer and fasting. They didn't, they didn't understand. Their souls got in the way. All right. I need to move on quickly because I'm almost out of time. <sighs> Doggone it. I'm out of time. I was going to try to push on, but I think let's... Um, Let's make that it for the night, and let me just read this to you. 
Did you learn anything tonight? I'm going to cast the devil out of my brother. That's what I learned. <laughs> Don't just cast demons out of people randomly. Do it really under the instruction of the Lord because unless you're willing to follow up or you know what you're doing, you could make them worse. Understand? Well, what if they're in your, what if they're in your household? Then you need to, if, you, if you're going to take on the undertaking, you have to pray over that person every day and pray the grace of God over them and the angels over them and the blessing of the Lord over them. And then when they, when they curse at you or something like that, you can't be moved by that. That's where the love of God prevails. All right. It definitely we took a different turn tonight than I anticipated, but that's okay. So this is what I see coming this year in the financial arena. I told you that the beginning of the year, the end of December, I had two dreams about prayer, about praying in the Spirit, and that this was a year of prayer, and we saw it already happening, the NFL and things like that and about the rain, and Belinda texted me, I saw it on my watch, and we were praying that California is no longer under extreme drought, so we've come out of the extreme drought. So, what is that, Bob? Well, that's dominion. Well, are we the only church that declared that? I don't know. I know we did. I know the Spirit of the Lord came upon me and said, the rain is just set, told me the rain is coming, I just kept saying it. Why did you keep saying it? There's something I learned from Kim Clement. When you have a prophetic word, you declare it over and over. If somebody prophesies to you and you, and you, you walk away and three weeks later go, hey, well, how, that prophecy was great that you received. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> it's not happening for you. It's to declare it over and over so that when the contrary comes into your life and you go, oh, this looks exactly opposite to what the Lord was saying to me. Which is why you should never want to have somebody prophesy to you. That's something that Kim, Kim Clement used to say this. He'd say, he'd say, the day that you get a prophetic word, he goes, it's the last peaceful day of your life. Now, obviously, there's the peace of the Lord. What he was saying was, when you get a word of the Lord, when God gives you a word, well, let's just do this. Have a little fun here. So here you are, just enjoying your life, praising the Lord, and God, He wants to release something on the earth right here, and this is time, so in this time He wants this to be released on the earth, and so God speaks a word to you. But you think it's about you. God thinks it's about his kingdom. Even if it's a healing word, Bob, yes. Because even a healing word that you get is a word that's going to spread through you. As you're healed, you spread the healing. It's not just for you. It is for you. Because Jesus bought it for you. But if he gives you a word, he wants it spread. So God... God gives you a word because he wants to manifest it. Your job is to receive the word. And here's the thing. This thing that God wants here, there is a demonic entity. Not very nice. Who doesn't want this to happen. So this demonic entity comes against you, not because of you, but really, he's coming against the word. This is what a lot of people that are praying, they're, they're playing around with prophecy don't understand. God gives a word for a reason. He gives a word because of his kingdom. So there's a lot of people, we all want to prophesy. That's, and that's actually awesome. If it's simple prophecy, which is edification, exhortation, comfort, that's awesome. But when you start to go more to like words of wisdom and things like that, things that speak to the future, not soothsaying, you understand what I'm saying? 
well, what's going to happen to me you know, in the next three weeks? I don't know. Just walk with God. You're going to be okay. No, I want to know. I'm going to go to the soothsayer down the street. They, they told me you know, what's going to happen this week. Yeah. Demons can give people things about you. Listen, the future, it's already there. We're, we're living in the exact moment of the correct realm of time. If you could travel into the past, which you can actually travel to the past, and people do it by, uh, um, what is that? What is that projection? Astral, astral projection. So people can go in, in, with astral projection to the past and the future. Now, astral projection is demonic, and you can get lost there and never find your way back. It's just a dangerous thing. I had a friend that he did it before he got saved, and, and he started just leaving his body, and he started drinking to keep his spirit in his body because his spirit just would start leaving his body. Another guy, he got so far lost, he, just, he, he got lost that he said, Jesus, and came back in his body and realized, I'm not supposed to be doing this. Now, God takes you somewhere in the spirit that's different. But our projectors and our government use them. They can go and they, they send them to places like the Lockerbie plane and they see the person who has the bomb and all. And so they can see things in the past, they just can't do anything about it. They can see it. Now, I've heard secular people say this. When they went into the future, they could see the future, but it wasn't set because the future's not set. God has a future, God has a will, God has a plan, and God has a purpose. Satan also has purposes and plans because he's trying to operate under the system that he learned from God. Satan learned from God, so that's why you call him a false prophet. A false prophet is not somebody who's just wrong sometimes. It's somebody who has a false vision of the future. Somebody who has a vision that is false. It's not true. It's not God's vision of the future. That's what psychics are and soothsayers and things like that. They have a false vision. They may not know they're even doing anything wrong. But when God gives you a word... That word is for the world. That word is for his body. It might be that he's going to heal your hangnail. But somewhere in the future, a thousand people might get healed because you got a hangnail that was healed that you couldn't get healed or something. God might give you word over, you know, that he's going to um, give you a house. Or he's going to pay off your house. He's going to do something like that. That word's not just for you. That word is, becomes a testimony for thousands. It becomes an evidence of the manifestation of his word on the earth. And people need manifestation. A lot of times I find when I travel now, and I, I try not to travel much because I don't like it like when I was young. I loved it, but I don't care for it that much now because <laughs> it's inconvenient. <laughs> but a lot of times I'd find that I'd go into places they had been taught to death. And I, I would try to teach, and it's just like, <laughs> it's terrible. So I would just start telling stories of manifestations. And the people would be like, they wanted to know, how do I manifest things? So I'd tell them stories, and then we'd have manifestation. It's pretty nice, you know, when you call the pastor's wife, say, I see this happen in your back, get an accident. And she says, yeah. And then she gets healed. Everybody's wide open after that. Now it's a party. When you get a word, you will be challenged. But the challenge is against the word. Really? You're the son of God? You're not the son of God. If you were the son of God, you could turn these stones to bread. What was the word? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. What was Satan challenging? He was challenging the word. What was the word? This is my son. Well, if he wasn't the son, if he believed the lie, yeah, how could I be the son? Because I'm out here starving in the desert, in the wilderness. How could I be the son? If he believed that, 
then he wouldn't have been the son. And he couldn't have died for our sins. That was a temptation. Adam was a son of God. He wasn't the word of God, but he was a son of God. He was not tempted, but the woman was. And she was tempted over who she was. Jesus was tempted over who he was, and that was the word. The word that God gave him was not, I'm going to give you this amazing ministry, and you're going to go through... Jer-. No, he didn't, it wasn't any of that stuff. It wasn't any of that stuff. Oh, my God. It's just so easy to get caught up in junk. The word was, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So here we're praying for all these knickknacks. God, God, give me a car. Give me a hot. You know, we're praying for stuff. Do this, you know, God, pray me. I'm not opposed to any of that, by the way. I just want to make it sound silly. Can you imagine if Jesus, after he hears the word from heaven, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased, going, hey, could you get me an apartment on the south side over here? Can you imagine Jesus praying that? That would just seem silly, wouldn't it? When he had the word, you're my son, you're, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. God's telling us we're these sons. And we're saying, I, I, need, I need $5. You know, I mean... <laughs> How did, how did demonic power get us praying over the simplest, stupidest things? Because they are blocking us from this. Now you are the beloved son on the earth. He's the firstborn of many brethren, right? Well, if he's the firstborn, we're the whatever born, but we're sons. Well, I'm a woman. Yeah, but you're, you're a son as far as authority. You have the authority of a firstborn. So we're praying over, God, give me stuff or do this or whatever. And God's saying, well, I, 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 I made you a son. Oh, yeah, great, thanks. By the way, no, no. If you're going to pray a prayer, don't pray over what you need. I'm not, listen, I'm not saying don't pray for what you need. You can pray for what you need. Don't make it your first prayer. Don't make it the first part of your prayer. Pray over who God is. God, reveal who you are to me. God, reveal who I am in you. That's the prayer that he prayed. He didn't pray, God, give them a bunch of stuff because they need help. When, when they needed stuff, Paul would take up offerings, send stuff to them. He didn't pray. He didn't pray to get stuff. These were his prayers. That you know me. The spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding, your heart being light. You would know the hope to which he has called you, what you are called to, sonship. Am I an evangelist? Sonship. The riches of the glory of his inheritance. In you. The riches of the glory of his inheritance in you. That's what he wants us to know. (laughs) I thought I was finished. I just had to take a different bunny trail. Now I think I'm finished. And it's gotten so warm in here, I'm going to have to walk out of the door anyway. So, Okay, let me say the last thing I started to say to you. I believe that we are defeating the enemies of God this year, that they're coming down, that the church is starting to rise up and declare who and what we are, what God is doing, 
Well, what the Antichrist is doing to the Antichrist spirit, I should say. And then just like in Second Chronicles 2020, when Jehoshaphat told them, and I should let you see that. In the morning, in the wilderness to Koa, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. And you know, as they went out and they worshipped, because we read it the other day, that as they did that, the enemies of God began to devour one another, and they spent three days taking the treasures from the bodies of the defeated enemies of God. That's where we are right now. But no, Bob, it looks bad. The economy's bad, and, and inflation's bad, and the chicken's like a 50% more, and gas is 100%. You know, you can look at all those things. It's true. I'm, I'm not saying it's not true. And we can declare those things. Or we can declare the mind of God. I'll tell you what California is. California is where possibly the greatest move of God the world has ever known came from. 1906, the Sousa Street Revival. The miracles were so profound. And the baptism of the Holy Ghost reignited throughout the world. It came from right here in Los Angeles. Amy Semple McPherson. Catherine Kuhlman. There were other evangelistic moves that came out of California and, and Southern California mainly. All of these seeds are here. And at least six or seven different prophets that I can think of have spoken that the move of God and the presence of God is going to rise up from the state of California. But Los Angeles and San Francisco, they're the most debauched cities in the... That's right. It's going to rise up out of those places. Right? Yeah. They could be dark places, but when, God, when God's army goes in, the walls come down, and they become part of the kingdom. We need to take over the Hollywood industry. We need to take over the Los Angeles industry. We need to take over the Silicon Valley. Who? The kingdom. The kingdom of God. Uh, Bob, that, they're Goliaths. I know. We start, taking, we start taking this stuff over. How do you do that, Bob? By, by declaring what the Holy Spirit says to you in your prayer time. Don't, don't say what he doesn't say to you, but what he says to you, you say it. When you see something in your prayer time, you start saying it. You start declaring it. This is your offering scripture, by the way. Believe God's prophets. I believe in California. If I didn't listen, if I didn't believe with all my heart, what God was going to do in California, I would have left here 15, 20 years ago. I believe what God is doing. And I don't fault, I have a lot of friends that left. We had a lot of people from our church that left Texas and Tennessee and Florida. I love them all. I understand why they left. But I'm not leaving. Why are you not leaving? Because this is going to be an epicenter of the glory of God that's going to rock the country. And there's more financial possibility in the state of California than any other state, any other three states. And a few minor changes, we could take off like, like you can't even believe. And then I could have my air car. I want, I want a gas-powered version, though. <laughs> I don't trust the electric ones. Mm, you're down at 2%. Mm. What? <laughs> All right. Just say this with me. I love you, Jesus. I thank you for your mercy and your grace. I thank you that you have called me 
to be a son. That you've given me dominion over the powers of darkness. I receive the dominion and I pray for revelation to understand who you really are and what you've truly given me. You're going to pray that prayer fully in a minute, but right now we're going to receive the offering. So ushers, if you would. I'm telling you, things are happening here in the gathering place and the glory of the Lord is falling. This is a good place to sow your seed into. So if you're making out checks, please make them out to the gathering place or those to Soaring Ministries. Same thing if you're texting. The texting should be right, yeah, it's right up there on the board. And um, if you're watching on the website... It'll tell you how to give. If you're not watching on the website, you're watching on Facebook or something, you can look at the board and it'll show you how to text in. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. I love you, Jesus. I thank you that you gave everything so that you could give me everything. I pray that you receive my tithes and offerings. Present them to our Father as an offering in righteousness, as a sweet savor. And we humble ourselves, Father, by proving you in this way. And we thank you Because of this, you have opened the windows of heaven and you are pouring out a blessing all across the state of California. We receive it. We receive the abundant provision that you're making for us. And Father, we thank you that you have rebuked the devourer over the state of California for our sakes and I thank you that inflation is coming down that the wealth of the wicked is being stored up for us that this is a year of blessing and abundance amen amen go ahead ushers if you would I love this message. This is the second time I preached it. <laughs> Last Saturday, a little bit different. I think I want to preach it one more time. <laughs> Amen. Maybe add something to it. But this is definitely something that God is telling us as a body. You know, he told us before Bill Young came, he told us that he wanted us to learn how to let him love us. Like, let God love you. And then Bill Young came and he gave us that word, that word of confirmation. So he's telling us, you're going to grow in the love of God. And I believe now he's telling us how to walk in our righteousness, but how to walk in our dominion. Because Jesus, it's not Jesus, Paul said that we would reign through righteousness. So you can't learn righteousness and not learn how to reign and how to rule. So in the coming months and years, you're going to learn how to reign and rule. You're going to learn how to walk in dominion everywhere that you go and everything that you do. Now, you know, Kim Clement prophesied to me years ago, he said, you were the bishop of Hollywood. And that's when we were going down to Hollywood. Mm Mm-hmm. No, the guy next to me. (laughs) And, and I have actually been to the house of many celebrities, prayed for them, ministered to them. And I've turned them down, too. I remember I got a call one night and said, Hey, Bob, can you come and pray for Charlie Sheen? It was a Saturday. I was preparing for Sunday. I said, 
And I'm preparing for Sunday morning. I'm not going to go talk to that son of, you know, <laughs> son of a gun. I said, he goes, I want you and Tipsy to go and pray for him. And I had a dream about him. I had a dream that his shoulder was hurt. It was at his house, and I prayed for him. He was healed. And um, he goes, yeah, he's got a bad shoulder. And I was like, oh. I didn't go. Why not? Because I thought Hollywood were scum. So I didn't go. And in essence, I disobeyed the Lord. Because Tipsy did pray for him, he did get healed, but then he couldn't do the mentoring that he needed. He maybe needed somebody to like get in his face, maybe slap him or something, you know, like, like that kind of a thing. Like a man that would just say, bring it on, buddy. I don't know. But let's just say it didn't happen, it was a disobedience, so... Some people thought, well, you're supposed to be going and ministering to celebrities. I go, I don't, I don't like that. But what I found through the years is that I'm praying that God brings celebrities before me. Like he brings them like literally before me and I start speaking to them. Then you're speaking to them, and they're, but they're, they're before me. I start speaking to them. And a lot of times when I see that happening, I'll see a change in that person. What does that mean, Bob? It means in prayer, you can speak to people. If he brings them before you. Now sometimes, not so much with celebrity, but sometimes he'll bring people before you, and then two days later you see them. So when he brings somebody before you, and you're, maybe you're speaking to them or praying for them, say, God, what are you saying to this person? Because he's going to bring you before them, or you're going to talk to them, or something's going to happen. And you can say, you know, your face was before me, this is what I felt. I don't know why, I just felt impressive to say that to you. That our prayers can go beyond just physical encounters with people. Paul said, he said, I went to you, to Corinth. He goes, I was there, I saw what was going on, and I judged this man. Now, I'll be honest with you. There are times that I've stood before in the spirit celebrities and I spoke judgment to them. No, Bob, we're righteous by grace. I know. But if somebody continually rejects the grace of God, they open themselves up to judgment. Do you know that Lot's wife was supposed to be delivered from Sodom and Gomorrah, but she wasn't. Why wasn't she? She turned her heart back. So she took the judgment that was not meant for her, but was meant for Sodom and Gomorrah. God loves everybody. He hates judging people like a severe judgment. Correcting people is a must. He must correct us. But he hates judging people. But what happens is God eventually judges darkness like evil darkness, wicked darkness. God will judge wicked darkness. If people hold on to the darkness, they will be judged in, in the midst of the darkness. And it's not that he wants to hurt them, but if they don't let go of the darkness, they will be judged in the darkness because if he doesn't judge the darkness, it will spread like a cancer. And America is, listen... You hear, I used to hear all these preachers, God doesn't judge America, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. You know. No. There are more praying people per capita in America than any nation in the world. There are more true believers in America than anywhere in the world. America has been a bastion of Christianity for the world. And we're not giving it up. Yes. We're not. This is, a great, this is a great nation. And has it been infiltrated by a lot of stuff? Yeah. And you go, how are you doing, Joe? And it's just the name's Josephine. You know. That was Sodom and Gomorrah. God judged the wicked darkness so it would not spread on the earth. God judged the land of promise 
Not just because the people were wicked there. There were giants in the land. There were, they were Nephilim. So he judged that bloodline so they would not pass on. Just like he did with the flood. The wickedness had grown so far on the earth that God judged it. Now you're seeing that kind of stuff now. Is it okay if I talk for another minute? Yeah. Let's stand up. If you're at home, stand up. You've been sitting too long. Couch potato. Put the Twinkies down. Pray this with me. My Father in heaven, and the God of my Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, I pray you would give unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, Father God, that you would impart unto me the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to know you through my deepening intimacy with you. Let the eyes of my heart be enlightened that I may know the hope to which you have called me and what are the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints. And I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of my imagination, flooding me with light until I experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling. That is the wealth of God's glorious inheritance that he finds in us, his holy ones. Show me, Father, what is the exceeding greatness of your power to us who believe according to the working of your mighty power. I pray that I will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to me through faith. Then my life will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through me, which you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead and set him at your own right hand in heavenly places. This is the mighty power that was released when God raised Christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority in the heavenly realm, far above all principality and power, might and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And you have put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. Amen. Amen. Now that was at least the first several verses. That was from multiple translations that we pray that the last couple I shortened because it's 820 and I want to let you guys get home. So I love you, appreciate you, you that are home watching, we love you. And I pray that God's grace would be upon all of us this week. And I pray that his kingdom, his righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit be with you. Have an amazing Friday tomorrow. We'll see you for prayer from 10 to 12. And those of you that we don't see, we'll see you Saturday at 10 o'clock. 9 o'clock if you want to come and pray with us. God bless you. You're dismissed.